Welcome everybody to another webcast by the Secure Ideas team. Uh, so this week we are going to be covering home security, and we don't mean like the ADP type. Um, it's the setting up your home network, um, that type of stuff. And with us today we have uh, Kathy Collins and Josh Kemp, two of our consultants who will be uh, covering this topic. And I will step back and let and let them take over from here. So, awesome! Thanks, Jason. Um, like he said, we're going to be talking today about uh, keeping our home networks safe and sound. Um, before we get started, a little bit about the two of us. Like Jason said, my name is Kathy Collins. I've been here with Secure Ideas as a consultant since 2021, um, based in Jacksonville, Florida, where our home office is. I uh, have a sec. Plus and CISP certifications. Um, my focus areas are networks, web applications, physical pen testing. Uh, those are the things that I am most interested in and try to spend the most time on. So other fun facts, I used to be a chef for almost 20 years. Um, and I have a teenage daughter and a corgi. They're both turds, but I love them. They're my favorite. Uh, horror fan. might see some of the stuff in my background. Uh, besides Jacksonville coordinator and proud Costco member, just like Josh. We both yes. love Costco, right? <laughs> <laughs> yes, I'm Josh Kemp. I've been with Secure Ideas for about a year and a half now. Um, I'm also based in Jacksonville, Florida. And my focus areas are vulnerability management and dark web monitoring for the company. So I get to see whose passwords got leaked and tell them to change them all that good kind of stuff and fun facts about me former bartender and dj for about 20 years 10 of those years was with kathy as my chef and me as the bar manager at the restaurant and then uh i'm also besides jack's coordinator and just overall tinkerer like to modify keyboards take apart and fix old turntables and other electronics things like that Cool. Well, to give you kind of an overview of what we are going to talk about today, key points. Um, to secure our home network, there's a number of things that you probably need to understand about it first. Um, what kind of ne network you're running, uh, different ways that they can be set up because, you know, there's not just one way to do that. We're going to go over some of the major ways and, you know, different options for those. Um, what devices are connected to your network? Also pretty important. You know, you need to count the gadgets because, you know, you'd be surprised when you go through like how many things you can forget, you know, in this day and age, everybody's got cameras and light bulbs and all kinds of fun stuff that's connected. And, you know, before you know it, you're like, why do I have 74 things on my network when, you know, there's only three of us in the house and we just phone or computer. It's a lot more. Um, also need to understand what it is that you want to protect, uh, what's important to you. You know, we all say we want to protect our data, but you know, what does that mean to you? You know, do you want to protect your personal uh, private information? Are you worried about credit cards, your photos, emails? Are you a digital hoarder? Um, do you have that top secret recipe collection that you haven't touched in 15 years somewhere on your computer? Maybe. me. <laughs> <laughs> but you might need it someday, you know? That's right. Yeah. I mean, and I then, literally do have like my grandmother's recipes scanned and saved somewhere. <laughs> yeah, that's the new thing, you know, I, I, it's and, and make sure that you know, you've got it backed up because uh, you don't want to lose those things. You know, ask me how I know about that. So where do we, where do we stash them? You know, do we use the cloud? Do we do on-site? Uh, how do we back them up? Um, and then budget obviously always comes into play with these types of things. You know, if you, you know, do you want a monthly investment? Do you want to put out a bunch of money initially or do you want to do it the cheapest way possible? You know, there's, you know, lots of ways you can do it basically for free if, you know, that's your goal. 
Um, and then how to deal with passwords. We're going to beat that drum just because that, you know, is literally one of the easiest, no cost or cheapest ways to keep yourself secure. And it's still, you know, something that we see every day, you know, Josh and I do tests and, you know, there's a lot of times where it's pretty easy to log into accounts. We're not so much breaking in, hacking in as we are logging in, you know, Default. not a lot of the time, but it's, yeah, it happens a lot. So moving on to understanding our networks and the types of networks that everybody has, um, Josh, you want to talk about sharing your neighbor's Wi-Fi? Not that you do that. Um, not that I do that, but I'm not going to say I haven't done that. Or more <laughs> so, they were more so they were sharing mine. But you know, either way, we've I guess we've been there. You know, if you're desperate, but there are there's going to be a lot of stuff that could go wrong with doing that. A, you're having to share that bandwidth. Um, anything that is connected to the network. You can see their stuff. They can see your stuff. Um, it's just opening a lot of doors. You don't know what kind of control, like if it's their network and you're up just, you know, leeching off of them, you don't know how they have the thing set up. You don't know, you know, you pro most likely don't have access to their router configuration to see what is allowed, what kind of, you know, encryption. You don't know. And, uh, you know, you could snoop their stuff. They could snoop your stuff. And... I mean, it's kind of similar to just being at like a hotel using public Wi-Fi or at Starbucks. You always want to, you know, be safe because you don't know who else is on there, what they can see, what measures are in place. So personally, I would use a VPN if I'm ever at a hotel, you know, whether a company VPN or I have a private one on my other devices. And then, uh, you know, just always make sure you use an HTTPS. Again, HTTP is not encrypted, so... Don't do anything sensitive on a public network or if you're sharing it with your neighbor's Wi-Fi, unless you have a VPN or some other mitigation step in place. I actually, I just thought of a, I'm gonna jump in here with a quick story because I think this is a relevant one um, yeah. with the sharing the neighbor's Wi-Fi. Uh -huh. This happened to a, it was a friend of mine, I was visiting him. And so it was between him and his neighbor. Um, and what had happened was, I guess, I, I don't know if he was intentionally sharing or if his neighbor had just been over at some point and said, Hey, what's your Wi-Fi password so I can connect or it was something that could have been something like that. But either way, he, he could connect to his, um, his Wi-Fi. And, uh, one day his kids, um, my friend's, uh, kids were, um, watching something on TV and then the screen switched over to, um, something that was very inappropriate for kids to watch. Oh boy. Uh, and it turned out that the neighbor had inadvertently um, streamed to a TV device and didn't realize they were on th their neighbor's network when it happened, uh, which was very unfortunate and bad and yeah, all around. But that's, you know, another case of, you know, you gotta be really careful when you're doing the sharing because that, that access, it's not just access to the information. It also could allow them to control devices on there as well. So, yeah. Yes, Definitely. that reminds me when AirPlay first came out and nobody had that lockdown. I had friends that were and they were purposely like, hey, let's send this over. What are you doing? You know, like, yeah. yeah. Um, another option uh, or the option that I use actually is my network is set up with a uh, Internet provided router. Um, and, you know, whether it's at and Comcast, um, which is a you know starting point for a lot of people. I do that um, because it's just, I know that when you, rather than buy a new one every couple of years as things get updated, if you keep on top of it, you can call them and be like, hey, I know you've got a new router modem out, you know, send me one and they will. Um, I'm with at and I have fiber um, and I've I've been through two of them already in the last two and a half years. Uh, so I just keep on top of that. And I've also got a, uh, I've got a Wi-Fi mesh system throughout my house. And the first Google Wi-Fi uh, device that I have acts as the router. It's plugged directly into my um, ISP's router. 
and or modem router and then there's a pass through and then that device actually is the router so it's an extra layer of security for me there um and the but some of the that's one of the pros you know it's uh they do automated updates which can also be a con if they're slow to roll them out you know because with the uh, the personal ones then you can you know you can do that stuff yourself but you also have to keep on top of it um they're generally complying with industry standards easy to reset to default if there's issues which you know if you've ever and i've had a bad experience with a router a long time ago. I mean, it was like 15 years ago. I'm sure things would be very different now, but this is just what I'm used to and where I'm at and what I'm comfortable with. Um, Josh, on the other hand. I, on the other hand. Personal router. Yes. I don't like to give Comcast any more money than <laughs> is absolutely necessary. Um, one day I hope to join Kathy in the fiber world. Um, if that means AT&T, fine, great, then perhaps my setup won't work anymore. But Comcast will not have that $14 a month rental fee from me. Mm -hmm. Not since I spent $400 on a modem router combo at Costco, you know, as we mentioned Costco earlier. So yeah, I like having that just so that I don't have to deal with them. But Kathy brings up a great point that once this is obsolete, then I'm going to have to go out and spend another $400 most likely, but it's still Wi-Fi six and it can take up to a gigabit internet. So I just have that plus uh, then plug directly into a little managed switch for all my wired stuff around here. Um, so like Kathy said, good because you have customizations, you can do whatever you want with it. Don't have to talk to Comcast as much, but if something goes wrong with it. Comcast isn't, going to be able to help you most of the time. I mean, maybe a little bit, but they're like hands I mean, off. Do they really help you anyway? I mean, they helped me get it set up. I had to do something and it involved talking to them. That was the last time I've had to talk to them about it, thankfully. Okay. Um, but I assume that they could at least add some visibility into an issue I wouldn't be able to figure out. But uh, so far, so good, at least. But you do have to stay on top of the firmware. I checked last night. I was getting ready for this. And I was like, I need to make sure that I'm like on top of myself because I'm going to feel like a hypocrite telling people what to do and then find out that there's some gaping hole, you know. But uh, I looked up the firmware version of mine and I can't even find what the latest one is. But everything that came up when I searched for it was lower than this. So I hope I'm up to date, you know. Yeah. There's a, a comment in the, in the chat about using a NetGate router with... Uh, PF sense. Um, yes. That's a good option there too, because you get um, you know that firewall capabilities and yep. flexibility there. Uh, I do something. Uh, I guess along along the similar lines, I have a firewall device. Um, so same thing. I, one thing I I really like about my setup now, my house is um, wired with Ethernet as well, which helps um, because the firewall itself is not a Wi-Fi. Uh, device. Um, so I, I do have a separate mesh network. But one thing that uh, has allowed me to do is is uh, split my network into VLANs. So I have one for work stuff, and then I have the home stuff. And that way, I make sure they don't actually ever touch each other. So. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah. And that's kind of like where I'm also in between with this, you know, the next option that we had here was the too much time on eBay full corporate world install. Um, which I am aspiring to, but man, that's expensive. <laughs> it's expensive, and then you then in a lot of cases there's subscription fees that yeah. you, that crop up with those. Yeah, yeah, and it's it's also ongoing. It's not you know it's not a matter of like set it and forget it. You know, there's a, yeah. a lot involved with it. So if you're a hobbyist, you know, with servers and advanced equipment, you know, then this is you know you prop you might be, you know, in good shape already. Hopefully you're on top of that um, mm -hmm. because there's a lot to keep track of, you know, and that's one of the things, you know, how, how easy do you want this to be? You know, how involved do you want to be with it? Um, how much money do you want to spend? <laughs> um, like, you know, PF Sense, that's something um, that I've been looking at. I've got a, a laptop that um, I'm probably going to put PF Sense on and start, 
using that, I want to, you know, do an IDS and IPS and um, some packet captures and stuff, you know, some fun stuff like that. That's on my list of things to do. Um, so if you can, you know, if you have the expertise and you don't mind the complexity to do everything yourself, you know, then that that's definitely an option. Um, you know, then we're talking about what, like probably server racks and dedicated VPN and a NAS maybe like, I mean, it could, you can get as big as you want with some of these things. If you have the space, <laughs> if you have the space, if you, you know, if your house the is the patients, the patients yeah, yeah, the time to, to put into it. But uh, let's see. Most people don't need all of that though. No, you really, you, you can do a lot with a little. And that's, that's the thing. It's, you know, it becomes a hobby, you know, at some point. And next slide, what do we got here? Oh, what devices are on your network? Always good to know. That's, uh, that's one of the things that you need to find out first. Like I said, you can, I mean, you, the easiest way probably to do that is to go into your router settings and uh, see what's connected. Um, you know, these days everybody's got game consoles and computers and tablets and phones and printers and um, all these different devices, like I said, that, you know, that we don't always realize are even there. The, I'd say the, the weirdest device that shows up on my network is a dishwasher. Yeah, <laughs> mine too. <laughs> when we bought this house two and a half years ago, as we replaced things, I was like, I want all the smart things. So we got the dishwasher and the washer and the dryer and, you know, and it's, it's a lot of stuff. And, you know, I don't use it that often. It's, no. uh, I don't know, do you use yours, Jason? No, uh, <laughs> almost yeah. never. The, it sounds cool, right? It, it's, uh, it sounds cool. The, the one thing I use the dishwasher for is it does uh, trigger a um, the, the little soap pods. It'll actually trigger an Amazon order for one of those. Uh, mm, okay. It won't submit the order. It just puts it in your cart, basically. So, okay. Oh, that's cool. Um, I would do that. I always get mine from Costco, my dishwasher. <laughs> <laughs> So <laughs> until until Costco has that that feature. Yeah. Of mine. Yeah, mine you probably won't need it then. Yeah, that's the only uh, the only thing I've ever used it for. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So it does sound cool. I'm sure we paid more money for it, but you know, another thing to add to the network. So what needs to be protected? Now that we have all these devices, we know what they are. Um, and again, how do you find out what they are? discovery router settings um you can also there's a few uh free network scanners out there i think angry ip scanner is one of them uh nessus has a free does nessus have a, a free option yeah they have nessus essentials right? and that's free to download and install the limitation with that is that it maxes out at 16 posts oh wow yeah so i I went through it at my house. I was like, I'm going to see, I'm going to get down to the bottom of only 16, <laughs> but you know, I don't know what was live at the time, whatnot, but I was like, all right, well, I'm going to find some other way to do this, run some in-map scripts or something, but. Yeah, we've got access to that. So I don't, I don't know if they, if angry IP scanner, like how much they can do. I know I've heard people talk about it, um, but another option is nmap, which is, not going to tell you what devices are on your network, but you can see, you know, what ports and services, uh, what ports are open, what services are running. And that can sometimes give you more visibility into your network and what it's doing and what's running on there. I'm pretty sure if you name it, um, if you have it named on your, uh, like in your router settings or name the device, Oftentimes I'll run an NMAP scan on something in my house. I'll dig, what the, what, what? Oh, Apple TV. I saw that somewhere. It's one of my Apple TVs, but. Yeah, sometimes it'll, I noticed that on mine too. Sometimes it'll, it knows what it is. Other times it's just like device. And then I have to dig around and figure out what it is and then add it in there myself. It's an ongoing process, right? Always. Yeah. Um, 
But when you're thinking about protecting your things, you know, think about also what do they do? You know, are they turning on lights and do you have cameras and video games, dishwashers, toasters, sprinklers? The list goes on and on. Does the video games you're playing need to have certain ports open? Do you know how to do that? Do you know how to make sure that they're not all open? You know, because I know if you need Xbox Live, I think uses like port 3074 or something like that and may not work unless that's open. So, I mean, and if you've got like the full corporate setup where you've got the firewall and you're denying everything, then you know, you probably have to go in and open those ports up. Um, which, you know, if you're, if you're doing the full corporate setup already, you probably know that, know how to do that and have fun doing that. Um, but then you have things like, you know, Amazon sidewalk. What is that? You know, is that on, you know, is that on my network? Or is that part of my network? What, you know, how do you see that? So if you're not familiar with Amazon sidewalk, it's, it's basically sharing bandwidth with your neighbors um, to extend the range of your devices. Like, you know, I've got a ring camera on my front door. Um, you know, I've got the Wi-Fi stuff all over my house, so I, I don't have a problem connecting to it. But like before I had the access points, um, that camera didn't have the best connection. Now, if I, now I did, I did opt out of the Amazon sidewalk. I don't, I'm not interested in that. I, I don't need it now, but you know, it will extend the range of your devices if they're on the edge of your Wi-Fi. Um, maybe, um, maybe they'll still work. Well, if you have a Wi-Fi outage, if your neighbor's is working and it, it it'll extend to there. You know, I don't know. I mean, by participating, your device is becoming part of a larger network, and uh, can this introduce vulnerabilities and help a target? Maybe. I don't want to find out. No. I've opted out. <laughs> <laughs> what about you guys? Are you do you have uh, or anything like that? I'm not even sure. I opted out of it as well. Mm -hmm. Um because when it first came out, I was like, Yeah, I don't I don't haven't done any real research into this. I don't know if it's safe. Um I mean they claim it is, but that doesn't you know, it doesn't mean somebody didn't miss something. Yeah, they say they're using encryption, but but you know, yeah, it's still what's being shared. Who can access it? It's still you know a potential path if it's not fully. I mean, if they didn't implement it correctly, it's a potential path to get jump from one network to another network. So, yeah. and it's using your bandwidth. Like you know, I have yeah one gig of fiber, but you know, not everybody does. Like, do you? You know, are you comfortable with your neighbors using yeah. even that small portion of your bandwidth if you don't feel like you have enough to begin with? I mean, if you're on Comcast, you're already starved for bandwidth. So exactly. I was just about to say, <laughs> no, no, it brought it brought back it brought back an old thought. Um, you know how if you're a Comcast user, you can if oh, I don't have Wi-Fi here, pull it up. Xfinity Wi-Fi pops up. That means that there's an Xfinity router somewhere and that I can log in and leech off of that. And that's another reason why I wanted to get my own private thing here so that other people weren't leeching off my bandwidth even more, you know, then it wouldn't be like an all the time thing, but there's been times my internet's down. Oh God, is there another one around here? Oh good. There's an Xfinity one I can log on, but I guess I don't want to share mine, but I will use other people's. Stingy <laughs> with it. <laughs> I work on this. I need my bandwidth. I know. I do too. <laughs> bandwidth hoarder, data hoarder. You know? Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Um, moving on with what we're protecting. Um, how are these things staying updated? You know, you've got a lot of stuff on your network. Do you know how they're how they're being updated, and where are the updates coming from? Um, what data are these things holding? All your devices. Uh, again, we talked about you know credit card info, personal information, your private data. You know, address all those things. Look into what they're holding and what you want to protect. Uh, let's see, Josh. Anything to you want to add to that? 
Uh, not really. I mean, I was, it's about how they stay updated. I, as long as it's a device or a service that doesn't run the potential of breaking something that I have set up, you know, then I always just turn everything to be automatic. You know, if I, if you can do it on your own, go ahead. But I have certain laptops that I use for certain things. So if the OS needs to update, I might need that to stay in this particular version because it won't work with something else I'm doing later. So some things I do manually, but if you're not doing anything weird that could break something else, I just turn all the automated, all of the updates to be automatic if possible. Yeah, that's right. That's a good point. Cause you've got, I know some of your uh, DJ software won't work with, um, I uh, know. God, remind me how much time do we have? I can talk. About <laughs> <laughs> right. So you can't. You can't update. I'm uh, like, well, system, right? this has to stay on Mac OS Catalina, or it won't work with that two thousand dollar mixer that's basically a brick sitting back there behind me. <laughs> anyway, that's a whole nother webcast. Right. And I, I thought this little sticky note was funny here. An update is available for your computer. Do y'all remember the days when Mac used to charge you for the updates? Yeah. I mean, I think it, it's been at least 10 years probably, but yeah. Snow Leopard, $29.99. Uh, say I have another one I can dig out here that was that generation of MacBook, yes. <laughs> yeah. uh, There's a question in the chat about uh, thoughts on Unify or uh, Ubiquity. I haven't used either one of those. Jason, you have some experience with that, don't you? Uh, I've I've looked into them um, because there's there there's a range of of um, of different I guess uh, classifications of devices there too. So there's some that are are more towards corporate, and then there's others that are more for um, maybe home use or small business or that sort of thing. And I've mostly looked at those smaller ones. Mm -hmm. um, I have myself not configured the uh, the bigger ones, but for the so the smaller one, the biggest issue that I had with with it was getting um, okay, yeah, um, the sixteen port managed switch. Um, that's overkill for most home networks. But as either a hobbyist or if you have a reason to split your network, like I do, like I'm, I use part of it for work, <laughs> and. Um, I'm doing pen testing on that, on that network, and then I have a separate um, for home. Um, then having having a uh, like a larger manager is, is particularly helpful um, because then you can set up different VLANs for things as well. Um, so, We're going to yeah. talk a little bit more about um, some of those devices here coming up. Let's see. SOS, security online software. What do you know? Yeah. Um, so this is kind of when I was going through here, I was like, all right, well, where do you start? You know, if you have a network with lots of devices, maybe you've got some access points, you don't have switches and servers and all that, but you want to start somewhere. Like, what do you do? Um, my suggestion would be to after you find your devices and what you've got running, uh, do a little bit of monitoring. You know, there's a lot of open source software out there that you can get and you can start monitoring your network. Uh, Zabbix, Prometheus, Cacti are a few of them. Um, I've started messing around with Prometheus recently, but haven't dug too deep into it. Um, those are more for like performance and health uh, of your network, you know, you can see what's running, um, your, how where your CPU's at, some data collection, more visual visualization, visualization into your <laughs> network. You know what I mean? Um, and then Snort, Security Onion, those, and Kevin, our CEO, was was it Kevin one of the people that originally worked on Snort? He did something with the base aspect yeah. of it. Yeah. But it's a, I mean, it's a, it's a great tool. Uh, it's got intrusion detection. Yeah, he he built base, um, which is it's for, I think it's for processing snort logs. I've never actually used it. Okay. I knew it was some connection. 
there. Or, or no, it was it was rule sets or something. Because yeah. the the original the original set of rules um, for Snort was it's called Acid, and that's where the word mm -hmm. base comes. <laughs> So. <laughs> oh, acid base. Acid base, yeah. I know the snort book uh, survived the the uh, cleaning out of our bookshelf at the home office the other day. Oh, good. Yes, it yeah. did survive. He's like, what about this one? It's got your name. Well, your name's in here. And he slowly started turning the pages. All right, we'll keep this one. <laughs> <laughs> I'll be sure to prop my monitor up on that when I come back into the office. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> There's another uh, monitoring it's a, a, I think it's called Waza, Waza, W U Z Z A H or something. Uh, I started to implement that here, but hit a roadblock and then got distracted by another project and haven't gone back to it. But it's cool because I mean, you just have to, you know, set up a client like on each device and then just have one. I think it was like Ubuntu server. I had it on running headless in the background, and then, uh, but it'll do everything from like vulnerability scanning it even had like an option to tell you if your device was pci compliant and like where you needed to make adjustments so it looks really cool i just haven't finished it but that's just another monitoring option that's always how this goes though right you start mm -hmm. something you start digging into it and then something else cool comes along and then you're like oh i'm gonna look into this thing now so um if you're you know, doing some monitoring, or even if you're not, you know, something else fun and to mess around with would be uh, VMs. If you're not already using, you know, Hyper-V or VirtualBox VMware, um, this is another way you can segment some of your services. Uh, you can test and experiment on there without worrying about affecting anything else on your network, do some malware analysis, patch testing. I don't know if you're going to do that for, you know, a home network, but, you know, there's some fun things that you can mess around with. And then when you get into the advanced security, you know, things like somebody mentioned PFSense, um, which I think oh, OpenSense is a fork of PFSense. Yeah, I think I read PFSense that. It's been around since the early 2000s, and then OpenSense is five, six years ago, maybe. Um, but, and a lot of people think of it, myself included, when I first started, you know, like somebody had said, oh, you should PF send. Oh yeah, it's firewall. Okay, cool. Well, it's not just firewall. Um, it's a lot more than that. Um, you can do VLANs on there, like Jason said. You can also do that with switches. Like I've got a 24 port managed switch that um, supports VLANs. And, you know, that's, that's something that I can do there, but PFSense will do it as well. Um, VPN, uh, intrusion detection, intrusion prevention, natting, load balancing, like there's all kinds of options there. Um, so, and I think I, I mentioned I've got a couple old laptops. Uh, if I didn't, I have a couple old laptops that uh, I'm using as servers right now. So, and that VPN, that can be in both directions. So if you have a reason to VPN all of your traffic out somewhere, then you could use it for that. Mm -hmm. But the other thing that I think is very helpful is mm -hmm. the ability, if you need it, to be able to VPN back into your home network. Yeah. There's some things that, you know, some options you have to get into your home network from outside. But, you know, do you want a remote in without a VPN? I mm -hmm. I don't. <laughs> <You know. laughs> yeah. One other cool thing that I'll add uh, for home network stuff. I actually, uh, I use a, a bunch of VM on an old uh, Mac mini that I just have mounted on the wall behind the computer, or I'm sorry, the TV in my living room. Mm -hmm. I just put a pie hole set up on there. So it just made a uh, DNS sinkhole. So I get a lot less pop-up ads on everything. I mean, it's not foolproof. I have to constantly update the, you know, block lists and stuff, but it's pretty neat if you don't want your screen popping up and flashing unwanted ads. That's another fun thing to do with a VM. Yeah. Or it's like a Raspberry Pi or something. Definitely. That's one of the first things I did when I was in school and uh, learning about networking was grabbed a Raspberry Pi and set up a Pi hole. Um, and like you said, you know, keeping up with it, updating the lists and all that, that I ended up getting tossed by the wayside. And it's not, you know, there was still a lot of stuff coming up. Everybody in my house was complaining. I'm still seeing ads for things. And oh, you can't sell it too hard. 
Yeah, no, I did. I was like, oh, this is going to be so awesome. We're not going to see anything. And then it's, it's not exactly how it works. It is a fun little project. It's pretty yeah. simple. Uh, but let's see. Moving on. So where do we store our stuff? Um, we're going to talk about storage and backups. Like they're not the same, but they're kind of two sides of the same coin. Um, where storage is more about access, you know, what are you storing on there, your files, your videos, your digital content, and the backups are going to be more about protection, you know, so that you don't lose those things. If, you know, there's a hardware failure or a cor you know, corruption of data. Um, but don't so want to corrupt grandma's recipes. Those cookies aren't no, right. No, no they, they will never be right again. Not that my grandmother measured anything. <laughs> <laughs> Those scanned recipes are like, you know, a pinch of this and a spoonful of that. But what's, yeah. what's a skosh of something? I get it. Skosh, yeah, a smidge. Mm -hmm. um, but when it comes to cloud storage, you know, everybody I think has heard of the big ones: Google Drive, Dropbox, OneDrive, Apple, iCloud. Um, a lot of us are familiar with these and maybe using them here and there without actually putting everything on them. Uh, kind of a hybrid situation. Like I've got on-site storage in my house. I've got a NAS and a lot of other storage, but um, on my phone, you know, I've got everything backed up there to the cloud. You pay two ninety nine dollars a month or something and, you know, it's just easy there. I think I upgraded mine to like $10 a month, but it's like two terabytes family plan and all of the photos on my wife's phone, my phone, iPads, they all just all go up. So, so. That's fun. Little... You can see each other's stuff too. Well, if I went into <laughs> a, our shared albums, I'm sure I could, but you know. Yeah. If you want the, um, I don't know if this is still the case, but the the cheapest long term option for cloud storage that I found is to actually use S3. It, the only problem is, of course, you don't you don't have a convenient interface for using it as a backup mechanism. But if you had like I took a um, a hard drive full of uh, photos, um, so it was close to a gig anyway, and then put it on there, and then basically set it to um, there's there's different storage options on there. One of them was uh, is like Glacier or something like that. I think I think that's what they called it. So it's it goes. It's hard. It takes longer to retrieve it, but if yeah. it's just for a backup, it doesn't really matter. Like you're not going to need that in the short term anyway. So hopefully right. you'll never need need it ever. But yeah, you know you can you can put a lot of data up there in Glacier and, and not have to pay a lot of money for it. And that's some of the you know, the pros and cons of, yeah. you know, cloud storage versus. Uh, so question, how did, how did I get it to S3? Uh, in my case, uh, I used the command line, the, the um, AWS command line to do it. That way I could have it just basically, it's like a, it's like a, a copy command, essentially, is the way it works. So when we talk about the backups in the cloud, you know, we talked about that a little bit. Um, pros and cons to all these things, right? That's why, you know, I think a lot of people end up with a hybrid situation, um, myself included. But, you know, the cloud, it's pretty accessible. You can scale up. You know, you can always pay more and get more storage. Not a problem. Like Josh mentioned, you know, sharing easier. Share with your family. You've got the, the photo album and you're not, you know, you're not having to maintain it, yeah. um, you know, and the security, you know, that that can be a, a pro or a con, right? Depending on how you look at it. Yeah, it is. It's it's perpetually available on the cloud, but if you lock it down right, you should be okay. <laughs> so. Yeah. <laughs> and then, but some of the you are internet dependent. You know, I'm I'm yeah. not. You can't. It's not. It's not easy to share stuff. Yeah. If there's all. never an apocalypse and we lose the internet, then you're never going to get your stuff. That's true. <laughs> so. And the, you know, the cost, like we said, you can just, you know, you can scale it up, 
keep paying more not a problem yeah and you, uh, never, you but you never have to like i'd say a, a plus on that with the scalability though is also you don't end up in that situation where you're using home one where you're you know at some point in time you're going to want to replace that drive that has stuff on it it doesn't they're not going to last forever and so you're going to have to go through a hardware refresh which means figuring out how to get all of that data from one potentially very old system to a new one and it's it's an additional hassle but you never have that hassle with cloud-based because they that all of that's managed for you yeah so for sure so you know you can just throw money at that at that problem you know that's exactly. yeah you know it's just you know what do you want to do what works for you right and the speed you know like jason was saying you know you've got your your backups there you know and and they're going to be there forever but you know you might not be able to get to them as quickly as if they were on your home network um, now, when we talk about on-site storage, you know, what options do we have for that? You know, we talk about internal storage is, you know, technically storage. Uh, you know, you're not going to, you, you're going to be limited at some point. Um, do you have a file server? Do you have a NAS? Do you just want to use external hard drives or USB use flash drives? Stacks yeah. of hard drives. Yeah. I, your I think I know which way Josh is going. Right. I think this has gotten really, really big. I mean, that's a four terabyte. Yeah, um, I've got mine's about the same. Mine's a two terabyte. I've got one on my computer that's, you know, I guess you can't see it, but um, it's it's not much smaller. But it's yep. two. Um, Brian in the chat's got a good point. That is where most of these came from. I upgrade, you know, take a spinning disk out of a laptop and put an SSD in there. What am I going to do with this? I'll get an enclosure, wipe it, reformat it, and now it's a backup for something. Exactly. So lots of ways to do that too, right? Um, and then the backups. What is this? Oh, really? <laughs> How did that get in there? I don't know. What is this, Josh? <laughs> well, that looks there. like a picture I took in your attic oh. while we were running ethernet down all your walls and breaking some plumbing in the process, which explains the next photo. <laughs> yeah. So pros and cons to on-site storage and backups. Um, you know, it is this one-time cost. Not really in theory, you know, you've got, and there were three trips to home Depot that night. And it's not one yeah. time. <laughs> yeah, so that was yeah, not one time. There were several. Um, but yeah, you know, I, I want I got a NAS for Christmas. Um, I wanted to run Ethernet through my house. Kevin, our CEO, and, and Josh were sweet enough to come over and eat the dinner that I made and get in my attic. And uh for some reason there's water pipes in my attic. It seems it seems like the worst place for them to be in case they break. Um and you know. You have to step over them to get through the attic. So that was inevitable that something would happen. But yeah, we had water pouring into my hallway. And, but a couple of trips to Home Depot, it's all fixed. My uh, Ethernet is mostly up and running. So <laughs> we'll get to that someday. Yes. Um, but yeah, so pros and cons to this too, right? You know, the energy consumption. Uh, I haven't, I've got a NAS running. I've got you know, the Wi-Fi access points, I've got an uninterruptible power supply, Raspberry Pi, a couple of laptops I'm using as a server, um, patch panel, you know, I, I, a switch. I've got a couple switches around the house, but um, I haven't noticed a, a jump in. Well, I think that, that the costs have changed. So, like if you compared today's cost to running, mm -hmm. um, like, like a home data center versus 20, 25 years ago, mm -hmm. it's substantially different because oh. like the cost of a hard drive um, and keeping that running because it has mechanical things that are always spinning is higher than a SSD by quite a bit. Yeah. True. Yeah. I've got spinning hard drives in my NAS, but again, there's only four of them. It's yeah. not have a huge data center. So the energy consumption probably not really that big of a deal to most people but the upkeep the investment and the single point of failure now that that's something that i have to figure out 
now too is you know i've got my storage on my nas and i've got it configured so that i've got backups of everything but if my house burns down you know <laughs> that's going to be gone no matter how well i back it up so then you know do you pay to have it you know that backed up into the cloud do you you know back it up every once in a while and keep it somewhere else like you know th those are things you need to think about as well right so a, a really good point in chat is the that i see it like two three times now is the ups and it's not just ups by itself but a good ups mm -hmm. and i think that's worth bringing up because there are a lot of not good UPSs out there. So you get the, these cheaper ones that don't really have uh, very much capacity. And, and they might protect you from um, like a, a short term uh, power issue, like very short term power issue. But that's about as good as it's going to do. Um, if, if the power goes out for a longer period of time, then it's, yeah, not so good. So, right. And mine's not going to, not going to, last for very long um if the power goes out just enough to like make sure everything's okay uh so moving on budget everyone's favorite so when we talk about the most bang for your buck the low-hanging fruit so to speak uh when you're talking about securing your home network um strong passwords you know, we talked a little bit about this before, but that's one of the best ways to, you know, one of the easiest ways to keep yourself secure. Um, encryption, you can do monitoring, firewalls, updates, and like a guest network is always, is a really easy thing to do if you haven't done that, you know, set up a guest network, make sure that's separated from the rest of your network and what i've done is when i've secured my iot devices i set up a second guest network called it something different and i've just put all my iot devices on there to keep that separated now i've got the option to set up vlans and everything with the setup that i have now i just haven't done it yet so again easy and free to do and that you could probably uh hide the ssd name you know or the um sorry the ssid name for your iot one so that people don't just see that it is available to attack i call it something that doesn't look like it'd be iot <laughs> on it but <laughs> i shouldn't say what it is but you know it's it's something separate at least for now and again with the budget you know what's important is it the cost you know do you just want it to be easy? Is it more about privacy? You know, your data, you know, you gotta figure out what's most important to you. So I said we were gonna talk about passwords a little bit. And I thought this was really interesting. So this little graphic here is from 10 years ago. And these were the worst passwords of 2014. Those are pretty bad, but if you look at the worst ones from last year, they're not much different. Um, I think admin has been added to the list. Uh, and you've got like one, two, three, four, five, six with an exclamation point on the end, maybe password has a capital P, you know, but they haven't changed that much. So, you know, this is something that everybody should do, you know, if you're not using a password manager, look into it. There's a bunch of them out there. Um, I'm not going to endorse one in particular, but I do use Bitwarden and I like it. Um, MFA, another thing, like if you've got the option to set up MFA on anything, set it up. I know it, it can be a pain sometimes, but really it's, I mean, it's easier than changing your 19 character password all the time. You know, it's a couple numbers, goes to your phone, usually pretty easy. Change your default passwords. Um, this is something we see a lot too. You'd be surprised how many, how many devices still are admin and default password. Admin, admin, password, you know, admin, password. It's, it's surprising how much there is. So make sure you do that. Um, 
And the, as far as strong passwords go, minimum of eight characters with a combination of upper and lowercase letters, numbers, and symbols is your best bet. When they say, you know, minimum of eight characters, we don't, you don't want to stop there, you know, because password is eight characters, you know, but that's not secure. So make sure you've got those other, other things in there. And this password below, that's what my Bitwarden spit out. I've got it. I've got a generator set up in there that whenever I need a new password, I just click that button. It's set up for 19 characters and for all the combinations of upper, lower letters, number symbols, and that's the that's what it spit out. You're not going to remember that, but you don't need to remember that when you've got your password manager. And if you're not familiar with them, typically you just have to remember one master password. Make it something long. Heroes use passphrases. Make your your master password a sentence, something that you know you'll remember, something ridiculous, some not not a line from a song or anything like that. Um, no dictionary words, but something that something that you're going to remember. Uh, well, I guess that would be a dictionary word. I meant no dictionary words for your regular passwords. Yes. And don't reuse your passwords, please. I mean, I know nobody here is doing that, I'm sure. <laughs> you know, if you when, are, I first, when I first started, uh, the old password manager we used in Secure Ideas would send out to Jason and Kevin uh, like a score <laughs> for all the employees. And if there were reused passwords, that score would go down, would go down. I didn't fail, but I had some work to do, you know. Yeah, and I've gotten I've gotten back up to making A's now, but and it's surprising how many people don't know that they just are like, oh, my password's really strong, but I use it on everything, on you know all seventy five, you know things that I log into, and you know if you don't know the the issue with that, it's that if that gets compromised in one place, it can be compromised everywhere. If somebody has your, you know dog's name and the year you were born and, you know, with the exclamation point on the end or whatever it may be, even though you think it's strong, um, they may be logging into your Kohl's account, which you don't care about. What are they going to do there? But then, you know, they can also log into your email and several other things. So I see it all the time with credential leaks and flair when, uh, you know, right. we look for dark web monitoring stuff and oftentimes it'll be the same email address over and over again, and then it'll just be the same password over and over and over or again. Or very, very slight variations of it. That's yeah, the other problem. One letter different, and maybe yeah. an A is an at symbol, uppercase, lowercase, but still. That's that's credential stuffing, what, what we're describing, by the way, in case you've heard it. It's basically the same thing, it's right. So we get one set of credentials from one place, and then the attacker would use that same set of credentials across a bunch of other places. Let's see what what goes through. So don't really use your passwords. Yeah. No. Long story short. Really the best thing to do is use password manager for just about everything. Um, yeah. It's really, once you get it set up, like there can be, you know, a little bit of time you have to put in to set it up. But once you do, it's like, it's the best thing ever. It really is. I've even started hearing people like lay people that are not in to, technical stuff at all, I've started to hear them just get a password manager. I'm like, all right. Yeah. And we are at the end of our slides. Does anybody have any questions? Anything we haven't covered yet? I hope you bought that hand, Kathy, in the picture. I, you know, I was looking at that. Yeah. And I think that's Ikea, but I'm not even sure. Oh, it's definitely it. Ikea, but I mean, it could be Costco. Oh, well, <laughs> I would have bought the hand if I saw it at Costco. Yeah, I know. I should have bought that. I found that picture and I was like, oh, that's perfect. And then my daughter came in here and said, what are you doing with that picture? My forehead looks huge. <laughs> so now we're going to talk about it. Yes, exactly. She won't watch. It's fine. She won't watch this. It's a, She really won't. So we'll send it to her friends, though. <laughs> yeah. There we go. All right. I don't see any questions. Oh, wait, here we go. How do you update your firewall rules? Well, I think that's probably going to depend from device to device. I just use the firewall that's built into my Netgear router here, and it's pretty straightforward. 
once you log in, security, firewall. Yeah. Most of the devices that you would, unless unless you're getting into using the eBay corporate type of solution that Kathy was describing earlier, I think most of the time it's going to have some sort of automatic update capability. And I know that's the case for, um, for well, for for a lot of the rules. There's, But I guess the other question on there, though, it might be, are you also referring to firewall rules to allow or deny tra specific types of traffic internally? Like um, where you want more control over things. Like for example, um, the firewall that I have, it has rules. I, I can set up rules on there to protect uh, my kids from going to certain types of websites or certain types of content. Um, that type of capability on there. Start wide up and then close piece by piece. So I would probably, I'm sorry, I was reading the question down there. Would you start yeah. wide open or and then oh, close? I would probably start close and open as needed if that were, it yeah. seems like it'd be safer. Yeah, and that's, that's the best practice approach in general for for any sort of security system where you're denying access to things is start off by denying everything and then open up what you need to open. And, and Mark, I think that would also address what you're talking about as well. So um, you only, only open up what you need to as you need it. Don't start with everything open and try to close things off. It doesn't really work that way. Um, it does mean that you we do end up in situations where, hey, you're trying to use a new device. It needs some port that you haven't done anything with yet. Um, and so it doesn't seem to work right. And then, yeah. Going back to the Xbox, you need to open this port yeah. so that Xbox Live will work with, yeah. Yes. Yeah, it's, if we're talking about what's the most secure best way to do it, that is the most secure best way. And you're right, it is a long weekend on the firewall rules. <laughs> yeah, it is a rabbit hole too. The more you learn about it, the more you're like, well, what else can I do? Yeah. yeah. But updates should be goes back to um, the other types of updates, though, uh, of rules of, of new attacks or new types of threats, that sort of thing. That should all be through automatic updates. Any other questions? Mm. Mm. Controls the best out of the box. Mm. Uh, so there's a couple of options there <laughs> okay. for, for parents. Di so Disney actually used to have one and the company that I want to say it's called family circle or something like that. I believe they still sell a device and it had a lot of really cool controls on it uh, for that sort of thing. Um, personally, Again, I, I, I know I, I'm not promoting Firewall. That's just what I have after doing a bunch of research. And part of the reason I, I use the Firewall is that it um, it has a lot of those capabilities built in as well. So there's a lot of extensions and, and extra capabilities that can be turned on on it. Um, I mean, a quick Google brings up Firewall as the first like five things. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> That's probably just because your computer's been listening to me. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm gonna have to look at the firewall also. Yeah, they have different tiers of them as well. So it depends on how much bandwidth you need and, and some of the capabilities. Um, but and they're expensive, but there's no but they have advanced capabilities that with other solutions you pay a subscription fee for but firewall has no subscription fee nice. so it's you, you drop the money down once and then it i've had mine now for several years and it works really well <laughs> 